Good morning, committee, and welcome to any member of the public joining the 4th of November 2021 meeting of the Western and Southern Area Planning Committee, which is one of the three area based planning committees of the Dorset Council area. Our area of remit covers the previous Weymouth and Portland Borough Council and most of the previous West Dorset District Council areas. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Council has had to put in place measures to enable the Council's decision making process to continue whilst keeping safe members of the public, councillors and council staff in accordance with the governance, uh, government's guidance on social distancing. As the regulations allowing the decision to be made at committee meetings from remote locations have now expired, the Council has decided that the committee will continue to meet uh, remotely and make a minded to resolution with an officer delegated to make the formal decision. The officer will make their decision immediately after the committee has voted on each item and will give reasons if their decision differs from the minded to resolution. Therefore, this meeting is being live streamed to the public and a copy of the recording will be available on the Council's website following the meeting. Members of the public are invited to make written representations, provided they are submitted to Democratic Services by 8.30 a.m. no later than two working days before the meeting. These representations will take the form of written statements of no more than 450 words with no attachments and will be read out at the committee meeting by our administration assistant. For the benefit of the public, my name is Councillor David Shortell. I'm the chairman of this area planning committee and my vice chairman is Councillor Bill Pike. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, members. Good morning to members of the public. <clears throat> Introducing other members of the committee is Councillor Dave Barwell. Good morning, Dave. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Councillor Kelvin Clayton. Good morning, Kelvin. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, all. Good morning to you. Councillor Susan Cocking. Good morning, good morning Susan. Good morning, Chair. Good morning to everyone else. Councillor Jean Dunsett. Good morning, Jean. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, Vice Chairman and all other members. <laughs> Good morning, Dean. Uh, Councillor Nick Arlen. Good morning, Nick. Morning, Chairman. Good morning to you. Councillor Paul Kimber. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Chair, and uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Louis O'Leary. Good morning, Louis. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning to you. Uh, Councillor Kate Weller. Good morning, Kate. I'll come back to Kate, Kate in a moment. Um, Councillor Sarah Williams. Good morning, Sarah. Councillor oh. John Worth. Good morning, John. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, everybody else. Good morning to you. I'll come back to uh, Councillor Kate. Well, uh, Kate, Kate, are you there? No. And Sarah, Sarah, are you there? Chair, I believe Sarah Williams is on holiday in France. Um, I, was, I may have to give her apologies. Thank you. All right, OK. Oh, that's fine. Now, now we know that's me. OK, and then if if, uh, if you let me know if it leaves when Kate joins the meeting, I appreciate that. For yes, we do, Chairman. Officers, thank you. For information, officers involved in the meeting include Mike Garrity, which is head of planning, Anne Collins, area manager for Western and Southern team, Bob Burden, Emma Telford and Thomas Wilde, who are senior planning officers, Hannah Massey, who's our solicitor for the day, Andrew Bradley, project engineer, Christopher, cycling and walking, walking officer, Zoe Linton is our technical officer who will be reading 
uh, the uh, uh, written represent representations from members of the public. And Denise Hunt, who is our Democratic Services Officer. We're now going to go to the um, agenda. And the first item on the agenda is apologies. To confirm any apologies for absence. Uh, uh, are there any apologies, um, Dennis? And I've just got one, of course, which was uh, from uh, from Sarah Williams. Um, I'm I'm just getting emails through Chairman from Councillor Kate Weller, um, who's having difficulty logging in. So I'll try and call her in from this meeting. And I'll let you know um, you if she that. arrives. Thank you very much indeed. When you do so, I will uh, I'll ask about declarations of interest. Item two on the agenda is declarations of interest. Does any member have any declarations of pecuniary or other conflict of interest, bias or predetermination regarding any item on the agenda? Councillor O'Leary has a query, Chairman. Um, yes. Uh, on the Custom House Key application, um, I have been uh, quite, I'm, I sat on the Harbours Committee, that's one issue. Uh, the other issue is I am a liaison for the Working Harbour Association and I've been dealing with several fishermen in regards to details on this application. So therefore, I think it's probably, and also my views on changes to the harbour is quite well known. Therefore, I won't be taking part in that application and I will just, so I, shall I just uh, take the camera and microphone off for that item? Yeah, no, you can stay in the room, but you can't participate in the debate or of course in the vote, as you've shown, as you've declared predetermination. Okay. Yes, you're turning your microphone off, Councillor O'Leary. That's all you need to do. Thank you. Is there any other declarations of interest? Uh, Councillor Weller has just arrived into the meeting, Chairman, for information. Uh, good morning, Chairman. Hi. Apologies, uh, uh, my computer didn't want to play this morning. <laughs> OK, I've just asked the Kate, does any member have any declarations of pecuniary other conflict of interest, yeah. bias or predetermination regarding no, any I, item on the agenda? No, I don't. You, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, yes, Chair, on the, much, on the first item re re regarding the application at the uh, heliport or heliops uh, that application uh, I would say predetermination may, may be a factor okay is that Paul yes Paul Kimber sorry and yeah, I, uh, thank you Paul and as you know I've uh, put a request in to speak on it Yes, I have got that. I've got that. And uh, and of course, you won't be participating in the debate or, or in the vote. Is that correct? Yes, Chair. Yeah, all right. OK, that's fine. Um, okay. ch Chairman, um, Councillor Weller, um, I um, on the first application, I live in White Creature, so I am affected by this application, but I have no predetermination. Well, that's fine. Thank you for mentioning that. I think as you've got no predetermination, then you can participate in the in the debate and, and you can vote. Thank you very much. And is there any, OK, that's right. Uh, any other uh, declarations of interest? Thank you. I would like to inform the committee and members of the public that because this is an informal meeting of the committee, which can only make minded two resolutions, we are unable to approve the minutes of the regular meeting held on the 30th of September 2021. This will be done at our next formal meeting. Thank you. We'll now take item three on the agenda, public participation. The committee receives a number of written representations submitted in accordance with the amended speaking protocol effective from the 20th of July 2020. That is the first three public statements received in objection and the first three in support, including the applicant or agent, will be read out by an officer not involved in the application. This number does not include representations received from town and parish councils or by relevant Dorset councillors. The written statements have been circulated to all members of the committee prior to the meeting. 
Uh, I just wanted to make sure that all committee members present has received the update sheet, which was received or should have been received by them this morning. If you haven't, please let me know. OK, Councillor John Orles requested to speak regarding item five on the agenda, but because it's, uh, it's, uh, um, um, he will unfortunately not be present for that particular item, he wishes to say a few words now. So the ward member from Councillor John Orrell, the ward member for Malcolm Regis, um, can address the committee regarding item five on the agenda. John, over to you. You have three minutes. Do I take it from this that John is not present? It would appear so, Chairman. OK, thank you very much. OK, well then we, um, in that case, then we we'll go on to item four on the agenda, planning applications. We have three planning applications before us today for consideration. <clears throat> the counter break, five or ten minutes will be taken as and when is required. The first item on the agenda is um, application 4A, which is WP 200467-OU2. Uh, OUT. It is the heliport at Coodway, Coodway, Portland, DT5 1BL, for the erection of building for servicing and maintenance of helicopters and additional facilities incidental to the helicopter use. This is an outline application which covers access, appearance, layout and scale. I will now invite Emma Telford, who is the case officer, to introduce this item. Over to you, Emma. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just share my screen. Can I just check that you can see my presentation? Yes, we can, Emma. Perfect, thank you. Oh, yes. Just come up. It, it's on uh, um, list mode at the moment, but I'm sure you bring it up to full size. Um, it should already yep. be yep. full size. It oh. is now. Perfect. Um, so this thank application you. is at the heliport. Um, and it's for the erection of a building for servicing and maintenance of helicopters and additional facilities. Um, it is outline application but they are looking for access, appearance, layout and scale. So the only reserved matter is landscaping. Um, so first off, I've got an aerial photograph of the site. Um, so you can see here, this is the, the heliport site. You've got an existing hangar building here um, with the helipad and runway. Um, you can oh, see... Should we be looking at the map? Um, um... Should we be looking at the map? And that, we are now. Sorry, I, I, I'm slow. Oh, your computer's slow. One of us is, but it's just should have on. an Maybe. aerial photograph. Um, yes, yeah, so you've okay. got the helipad and, and runway, the existing hangar. Um, you've got Portland Castle over here. Um, Neighbouring commercial buildings adjacent to the site here, um, and you've got that existing dry stack there. Um, access to the site is off Codeway down here. Um, and then on the other side, you've got the location plan, which shows the runway, the existing hangar and helipad, and then the proposed hangar building to go in here, adjacent to those commercial buildings that you can see there. So in this part of the site here. Um, I'm sorry, this is actually quite faint, but this is the proposed site plan. So again, you've got the existing commercial buildings um, neighbouring the property here, um, and then the proposed hangar to go in here. Um, and that shows the relationship with the existing hangar building, which hopefully you can just see there. So the next slide is showing the elevations of the proposed hangar building. Um, so this one at the top is what would be the front elevation. And obviously you can see there the, the doors to the hangar. Um, and then this would be the rear elevation that would face those existing neighbouring commercial buildings. And then you've got the two side elevations down the bottom there. Next up, we've got a ground floor plan of the proposed hangar. 
and you can see there that the main bulk of the building um, is the hangar which would be used for the kind of the maintenance of, of the helicopters. Um, so next up we've got a first floor plan and a second floor plan um, again showing obviously the height of the hangar in the main part of the building um, to give that required height for the helicopters and to be able to maintain them. Um, on this one you can also see the uh, trainee accommodation which is made up of a bedroom and ensuite with shared kitchen facilities and then on the other side of the building you've got the um, simulator which would be used for training and you can see that in both the second first and second floor plan there um, and then there is other additional rooms um, for support areas for things like offices uh, so these next plans are the third floor plan and the roof plan um, again, you can see some um, of the trainee accommodation on the third floor plan there, which totals 12 rooms. Um, the next slide shows some sections through the building. Um, so you can see kind of the trainee accommodation and support areas here. Um, and then again, the main part of the hangar, um, obviously giving the height to, for the helicopters and then space to maintain them. Um, and then you can also see the training simulator in there as well. Um, this section here shows the height of the proposed building in relation to those neighbouring commercial units. So you can see the height of the neighbouring commercial unit there and then the height of the proposed heliport and then it, um, hangar, sorry. And then it does have this curved roof design. So it sweeps downwards um, at the boundary and then it reflects the height of the commercial um, buildings that it's adjacent to there. These, these first set of photographs are taken um, up from the Olympic ring, ring sculpture looking back um, at Osprey Key. Um, obviously this first one's a bit more zoomed in but you can see the existing hangar building here, um, the runway and the helipad and then you can also see that these are those neighbouring commercial buildings so that the proposed hangar would sit in the site in front of those there. Um, and then this is just to show, uh, obviously, the, the zoomed out picture looking back at Osprey Key. Um, so these next photos are taken from the car park off of Mulberry Avenue, um, looking back at the site. So again, you can see in both photos, you can see the existing hangar building. Um, and where those neighbouring commercial units are so that the pro proposed hangar would sit in front of those, um, still leaving sufficient space uh, within the site and for the helipad there as well. Um, these next ones are, were provided as part of the application, um, but it does show that kind of wider out view of the site in the local context. So you've got the Sunseeker building and the dry stack behind. Um, and then the bottom one obviously shows the proposed hangar would be in here and it does show that there'd still be sufficient state, um, space within the site as well. Next images obviously show how the proposed hangar would sit within the site um, and you can see that relationship of the proposed hangar uh, with the existing um, and you can also see that relationship of the proposed building uh, with the pedestrian esplanade there as well. Um, so the key planning issues for this application are the prin principle of development. Um, the site is located within the DDB um, and the proposed hangar building would be within the existing heliport compound. Um, it is considered to comply with policy port one. Um, it does include some training accommodation, uh, but that would be ancillary to, um, to the existing heliport use. Um, Neighbouring amenity, um, concerns have been raised regarding noise from um, primarily from the landing and takeoff of helicopters. Um, the site is considered to be removed from residential properties. Um, environmental health have raised no object comments in relation to noise. <laughs> um, the heliport, there is currently no restrictions in terms of um, the amount of takeoffs or landings or the hours that these can be done. 
and it's considered that the proposal for the new hangar is to provide additional space for long-term servicing and maintenance. Um, and then visual amenity and setting of the heritage assets. Um, the separation between Portland Castle would be maintained. Um, the design is varied so as not to result in one large mass. Um, and the proposal is to supplement current activities. Um, and it's therefore considered that it will not um, increase the intensification of impacts from noise and vibration um, than is already currently uh, normal and lawful um, conditions for the site. And then biodiversity. Um, and then the recommendation for this one, uh, which is set out in the officer's report, but it's also um, on the part of it is also on the update sheet as well. So it's for both to be read together. Um, but it's that committee be reminded to delegate to the head of planning to a grant um, that is subject to a legal agreement um, to secure a financial contribution for mitigation to the recreational impacts on the Cheselin fleet. And that is due to the kind of training accommodation um, and how obviously users of that accommodation will be um, staying in proximity to the Cheselin fleet, so may want to use it for recreation. And then the conditions are the standard kind of outline conditions, uh, so the time limit and plans um, for material details to be submitted. Uh, you've got two conditions there to cover uh, surface water drainage. Um, the next condition is for the, stu the trainee student accommodation to only be located on the first, second and third floors only uh, due to flood risk. And then the, the final condition is for um, a native planting landscaping scheme to be submitted and agreed. Um, and that is it for this one, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Beautifully presented. Uh, I now invite, I invite Zoe Linton to read the written a uh, written statement submitted democratic services by member of the public. So, so over to you, Zoe. Good morning. Good morning. I just realised my screen isn't blurred. Beg your pardon. Don't worry. We like sunflowers. <laughs> There we go, that's better, isn't it? Mm -hmm. right. Philip Tyso, if the new hangar building reflects noise, it could cause a dramatic increase in the ambient noise directed towards residential areas and Portland Castle without any increase or change in activity levels. Has the question of reflected noise been examined and addressed? If so, where can I find the, this in the public reports pack or planning documents? Jennifer Meadows. As the proposed new hangar will be facing the residential properties, would it not be fair to consider compensating the local neighbourhood from the negative impact this new development will produce on our mental health from living with increased and unpredictable noise? Would the planners please consider restricting the times of the heliport's proposed operations as well as the number of flights should they grant this application? Steve Gladstone, Gladstone CEO Heli Operations Applicant. Heli Operations provides aviation training to civilian and military clients. Customers include the German and Pakistani navies, the no Norwegian Air Force, the UK Empire Test Pilot School, CHC helicopters and the Irish Coast Guard. We operate from three sites in the UK, Portland, Somerton and RNAS Coldrose and employ 50 people. Heli Operations is engaged in the new Coast Guard contract and expects to be providing engineering support to a new fleet of aircraft. Safety. Heli Operations operates on a beyond compliance basis with safety at the core of all our military and civilian regulatory approvals. Economics. The majority of Heli Operations staff are based at Portland 
with significant economic benefit to the local area. All employees are well paid with everyone above the national living wage. Teleoperations recognises the importance of our relationship with local communities and wider society and have provided over 40 jobs to people who live locally in Portland. Heli Operations supports local industry choosing local companies by preference for services that include manufacturing, marketing, vehicle maintenance, facilities maintenance, cleaning and staff training. Local area. Heli Operations has a policy of supporting local good, good causes, charities and groups. We have donated to charities, including Public Space on Portland, a local music festival, providing kit to a local children's football team and a computer to a Cub Scout group. We welcome visits from local schools and groups and Heli Operations also supports a flying scholarship scheme for young women hoping to make flying their career. Whilst we recognise the environmental effect of operating aircraft, we do all we can to minimise the impact. We have, an up, we have upgraded all lighting to LED, install, installed water collection systems and subsidised electric car charging points. We intend to replace our pool cars with electric cars over the next two years. And to date, six staff have joined the government's cycle to work scheme. This year, we have provided work experience places to three students and provide volunteering experience for an adult with mental health needs. In 2020, we started a graduate apprentice scheme and have our first student on a shared academic practical course. He is progressing well and we expect that he will remain with Heliops post graduation. Heliops has provided the use of the base to the local NHS to conduct drive through flu vaccinations and we remain available for other uses. Summary. In summary, Heli Operations is a high value and expanding company with a very strong commitment to our Portland site. As we continue to expand, we need additional space and infrastructure, which this new facility will provide. We offer high technical employment to local people and add significant value to the local economy by contracting with Dorset based providers. Heli Operations is a responsible employer committed to everything it does. Ken Park Planning Consultants Agent. The proposals are for an engineering and training facility to support the existing heliport at Osprey Quay. The building is designed as a three bay aircraft hangar with a glass fronted element presenting towards the coast. Local plan policy and the Osprey Key master plan specifically supports an ongoing role for the heliport and the development of industrial employment led uses, including engineering and maritime uses. The area has a long association with maritime and aviation activity and the proposals are a continuation of that tradition supported by planning policy. The application has been subject to very detailed scrutiny. The activities taking place within the building will not be audible or discernible from the outside build, sorry, from outside the building. Aircraft will be stationed for periods of time whilst while being serviced and repaired. Similar activities currently take place within the existing hangar and are not audible outside the building or the site. There is no objection from the EHO on noise grounds. The building is sited adjacent an existing large scale building and will be read in views from the west as part of the industrial complex of Osprey Quay. The building is separated from historic buildings to the west by open space. The heliport runway and the Mulberry Avenue car park 
which is now being developed. Natural England and the Environment Agency have raised no objections. There has been overwhelming public support for the proposals. Objections based on noise from existing activities of aircraft taking off and landed, landing should not attach weight. These are existing lawful and well established activities. The building is well designed and will represent an enhancement. The proposals provide multiple benefits and will not result in harm. The proposals accord with planning policy. They are fully supported by your officers and the applicants respectfully request that planning permission is granted. That's all. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Zoe. Thank you very much. I now invite Councillor Paul Kimber, who's the ward member, to address the committee. Paul, you've got three minutes. Thank you, Chair, fellow councillors, and uh, thank you for allowing me to uh, speak regarding the uh, this. Um, I wonder if with the overhead photograph, um, Emma could, could show the houses that uh, abut the uh, heliport. Uh, we, we don't seem to have, uh, we seem to have missed the local houses within within the report to councillors. I uh, hope if you can show those houses. Uh, thank you very much. And you can see from from Emma's um, red dot how how close those homes are to that uh, heliball. I want to say one thing. It's too simplistic to say whether you're for or against this application. What I have as a ward councillor is a noise issue and a fumes issue and I believe some of some people uh, I believe people from um, white the area of white that surround it have also given out issues with noise I believe that we have this would have been a golden opportunity to look at the noise area and to see if we can make life any better for those homes uh, that uh, abut the heliport uh, and and to look at uh, and I believe Jennifer made a very good point with regards to times. Um, I want to say when the Admiralty or when the Fleet Air Arm had the, had the base there, and uh, many of us will remember that we had some of the way the noise that the Admiralty dealt with it. They had two barges in the middle of the harbour, and I remember quite quite well because they were called the RN50 and RN52 and a lot of the landing and taking off then was done within the middle of the harbour so the noise was mitigated towards more the middle middle of the harbour. These are sea kings and so they, they tend to be the, the very noisy uh, helicopters. So this is the problem I have with, with this application. It's not a case of me saying, oh, uh, you know, just writing it off. It's a it's a case of dealing with these two points as uh, as I've had to take the complaints and from many people surrounding the area in regards to noise and fumes. So I would ask the committee to take that into consideration when they're making their deliberations. Thank you, Chair, and uh, I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, uh, Councillor Kimber. I just wanted to check with the, uh, the committee. Have they heard of uh, those presentations? OK, because I and my end, I did break up a bit. Is everyone happy? Uh, it's all fine at my end, uh, Chairman. Uh, uh, any other members have problems? <laughs> no, absolutely fine. All fine. No, no fine. 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 It's my end. OK, yes. OK, I now call on Emma Telford to respond with any salient points you may wish to clarify. Over to you, uh, Emma. Thank, thank you, Chair. I think the kind of the main point coming out of there was um, was noise and fumes. Um, so environmental health have raised no comments in um, relation to noise. Um, the proposal is for a hangar for the servicing and maintaining of the helicopters. Um, some operations under the 
existing use could be carried out outside um, and this proposal would mean that they'd all be done um, within the new proposed hangar building. Um, the proposed hangar building provides additional space supplementing the current activity on the site. Um, the site currently has no restrictions on times of flights, numbers of flights. Um, and in terms of uh, the new hangar reflecting noise, um, I'll just go to one of those section drawings if I can. Um, so this bottom section drawing here shows the height of the uh, neighbouring commercial buildings and it shows obviously that the proposed hangar at the boundary is a similar height, although it does raise up slightly. Um, those existing commercial buildings are quite a large expanse already. Um, and like I said, the proposed hangar wouldn't be that much greater in height than those. Um, so it is similar to um, the height of those existing buildings. And then again, in terms of the fumes, I think it comes back to that the, there isn't any existing restrictions and that this proposal is for the proposed hangar to do the maintenance and servicing of helicopters, not an intensification of flight um, that there already isn't any restrictions on. Um, but that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. That's fine. OK. Committee, are there any questions of a technical nature for the case officer? Uh, there are two uh, two people wishing to speak, Chairman. That's myself and Councillor Weller. I think my, my question has been partially answered uh, uh, by Emma. Um, so I take, just for clarity, I'll take Councillor just, Weller first then. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I, I know you've already... Uh, oh, you want to take Councillor Weller first? Uh, yes. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for Councillor Pipe to speak first and then I'll, I'll speak after him, um, Chairman. OK, I, I thank you very much. The chat, Chairman, okay, I, would, you. I would like to speak first. Um, uh, just for clarity, are, are there any plans for an increased flights? Uh, and if so, I doubt whether the level of the, uh, the flights would reach the uh, capacity of the uh, a very busy period between the 1960s and 1990s at the height of the sea training facilities at Portland. Now helicopters have been an integral part of, of the history and the aviation history of Portland since 1948. So are there any plans for an increased number of flights, which is a concern of Councillor Kimber's? Thank you, Councillor Pipe. Could you answer that please, uh, um, Emma, please? Yeah, so I think again, the main thing to highlight is there's currently no restrictions. Um, so there currently is no restrictions on the amount of flights. Um, the proposal is to provide additional space for servicing and maintaining of helicopters. Um, helicopters going in there um, could be in there for kind of up to or at least four months being serviced. Um, a lot of the helicopters going in there, the the applicant has set out would actually be going in by lorry um, because of the state they're in um, and because they're then in there for so long there might be additional flights but it wouldn't be additional flights on a daily basis because it would be after the four months of them being maintained. Okay thank you very much. Thank you Chairman. Uh, okay. Councillor thank Weller then Councillor Clayton Chairman. Okay. Um, Councillor Weller, would you now like to ask your technical question? Uh, thank you. Uh, a couple of things, Emma. Um, you speak about the new, the additional height of the new building um, in relation to the existing. Um, we can see from the plans that you gave that it, it, it is higher. Um, do you have an idea of how 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 much higher uh, they are than the existing building? I mean, are we are we talking about a full story is height or all sort of half story or, or what? So I don't know if the current Im images on the screen help, but they show that the proposed building in relation to the um, existing hangar building and you can see there it's actually set down a tiny bit than the existing hangar building. Um, and then the other plan I had was uh, this one here. So the eaves height of the, the proposed hangar is 
set down slightly than those existing neighbouring commercial properties but you do then have that sloping roof that up. sloping roof there yeah yeah it, it just it, it's not altogether um you one can get an impression but but not not a full impression um so that's fine thank you um the the other comments i have to make that they are sort of technical in so far as my assumption is that if they are um servicing more helicopters they will then be testing more helicopters so there will be additional flights um i um i don't see that as particularly a problem because they will be testing those flights um during daylight hours um uh, predominantly um is my assumption um i am concerned like everyone is um on other matters but they're not technical matters so it was that height that i really just wanted a little bit of clarification on so thank you very much thank you chairman thank you emma i think thank you thank you very much indeed uh, uh councillor uh, i believe we've now got uh, councillor clayton who wants to ask a technical question yes thank you chair um noise seems to be the main issue has there been any monitoring of noise levels and have there been any complaints about noise levels prior to the application going in thank you for that i'm, I'm now going to pass that over to uh, to emma to reply sorry if you hear my dog bark in the background um a noise report was submitted as part of the application um, and that is what environmental health have considered and raised no objections to. Um, we have received responses to the application obviously raising concerns about the current noise levels. Um, but again, I just want to reiterate that there currently isn't any restrictions um, on the amount of flights or um, the hours of those flights currently. So there's been no actual monitoring of noise levels on a regular basis? Not as part of this application. OK, thank you. I have um, three members who wish to speak on a non-technical matter, Chairman. So if you'd like to move on, that'd be that'd be good. OK, thank you. There's no more technical questions to be asked. No, uh, before no I open the debate, before I open the debate, members, may I remind you to direct any questions or remarks through the chair, and I will invite members to speak in turn. Request a request to speak needs to be made via the virtual chat facility. Can I also remind members that the chat facility is for the smooth running of the meeting and must not be used for discussion on the merits of an application. Please keep microphones on mute when not speaking to preserve audio quality. I now open the debate to members. Now, who have we got to speak first, uh, Bill? Uh, uh, Councillor, Councillor Weller. Oh, I beg your pardon, Chairman. Uh, Councillor John Councillor Worth. Weller, OK. John Worth, I beg your pardon, Chairman. Uh, Councillor sorry. Worth. Oh, sorry. Uh, Councillor Worth. Uh, OK, yeah. Councillor Worth. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. You and thank you to the, to the officer for the uh, comprehensive report. Um, we are looking at the application before us today. Um, and that is for an additional hangar for servicing. Um, we're not looking at the operation of heli operations regarding noise or any uh, anything else. They have the right to fly when they fly. That's a historic thing and helicopters have been based there for many, many years. Um, and, you know, a lot of the new property that was built around there, the heliport was already there. Um, it was being used by search and rescue and other people. So. Um, in regard to that, I'm quite happy um, to propose that we have a minded to decision to accept this application as presented by the officer. Thank you, John. Who we have next to speak, uh, Bill? Yes, uh, Chairman, we, we have uh, Louis O'Leary, Councillor O'Leary. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I completely agree with what Councillor Worth just said. Uh, we're only looking at the hangar here, an additional hangar. We're not looking at the actual operations of a uh, of a new, um, you know, operations of the site. Um, I was in a, a meeting the other day, we talked about social mobility, and places like this provide really good, decent jobs, and so therefore I'm happy to second uh, Councillor Worth. Okay. 
for which I'll apologise. Well, we've got a proposal. I just beat to it. Can, can, I, can I take that proper proposal and second it um, to include the amendments to the, the conditions as laid out in the update sheets? Are you all happy with that? I'm happy. Well, I'm happy with that. I'm happy. happy. That's OK, any other speakers, Bill? Uh, no, Chairman, but you did have competition for the second. Uh, Councillor Susan Cocking also wished to second, but I believe okay. you've, you've taken you taken okay for O'Leary's. Or... Sorry? Did you want to make it to us, Susan? Oh, sorry, Chair, I didn't quite hear you. Would did you like to make a contribution? I, I know you're about to say, Yeah, um, I would just like to say that um, I agree with what Councillor Worth and Councillor O'Leary say. The um, helicopter base and helicopters um, Portland has a strong history with that um, and we are looking at the hangar and that actually will mitigate some of the noise because the servicing and everything can be done in the hangar. It will bring, bring more benefit, economic benefit to Portland as well um, and uh, the housing, ha ha people choose to choose where they live um, and it's a bit like someone moving next to a pub or a church. Um, and it's not for more helicopters, it's actually to actually promote the economic benefits of Portland, train young people, they're offering apprenticeships. So that's what we're all we're all asking for. And if we, we vote against this proposal, then we're actually saying we're voting against uh, young people's apprenticeships and uh, everything like that. So I think, it's, you know, it's benefit to Portland and the wider eco uh, um, economy. So that's why I would be happy to second it. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, Chairman, before we go any further, I've, I've erred in, in my um, in, in my list. I, I've missed off Councillor Weller, who would like to speak. Okay, all right, uh, uh, Councillor Weller, you would like to speak. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, in fact, Councillor Cocking has has just pretty much said everything that I have. There, there, there is some noise element and historically there have been complaints about noise and pollution um, from the helicopters going over the houses and I wish they would fly over the sea rather more frequently than than over my house. Um, but having said that, the economic benefits to the community far outweigh um, my cat rushing around like a mad thing at 11 o'clock at night. So um, uh, I will be supporting this application. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Councillor Anna. Um, you're free, right, you're free to move now, Chair. To speak, uh, um, yes. Now you're Go free ahead. to move to the vote now, Chairman. OK, thank you. I, right, I'm going to... Um, I, I beg your pardon, Chairman. My, I have uh, Anne my, Collins. My, my... I do have Anne Collins, Chairman, right on the, right on the, right on the hammer. OK, Anne, would you like to say a few words? Chair, only to say you've clarified that the um, proposer a seconder of doing it in accordance with the update sheet. But just to clarify as well, would that be recommendation A and B? Because recommendation B is to um, effectively minded to delegate authority to refuse should the Section 106 agreement not be completed in a timely manner. So if we can, if we can just clarify that with the um, proposer and seconder, please, Chair. I, I'm happy with that, Councillor O'Leary. Yeah, that's, that's fine, Councillor Worth, yeah, it's no problem. Okay. Is that okay, Anne? Okay, right. Yeah. If there's no more deliberation and members of content have heard the entire presentation debate, I will see. I will now take a vote by roll call, having got a proposal and seconder. So, Councillor Bowell. Uh, yes, Chair. I'm minded to approve. Thank you, Councillor Clayton. Uh, yes, approved, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cockin. I'm minded to approve, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Dunsey. Minded to approve, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Pipe. Minded to approve, Chair. I'm for. Thank you. Councillor Ireland. Approve. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, for clarity, um, Councillor O'Leary. Approve, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Weller. For. Thank you very much indeed. And Councillor Worth. Four chairman. Thank you, that's unanimous. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, sorry, 
Uh, and I approve also. Uh, and so that is unanimous. Uh, sorry, okay. Councillor Councillor Shortell. Sorry, it's, uh, you, you just need to hand over to me now to yes, I read the word. Sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> just preempt your, I your thoughts. <laughs> I now ask Mike Garrity to make the formal decision on this item. Thank you very much. I can confirm I have listened to the office presentation, heard the debate, and that this application will be determined in line with the committee's minded to decision. Thank, <coughs> thank you, Chairman. That concludes uh, item 4A on the agenda. Right, uh, members, uh, we'll now uh, go to item 4B on the agenda, and that is the application PFUL 20210554, which is Stoneborough Manor, Stoneborough Lane, Charmouth, Dorset, DT6 6RA, and that's for the conversion of an existing manor house to five dwellings, including extensions. Use Stone Barrow Barn as an independent dwelling, and that, that means the removal of, of condition four of 1W2002086, holiday employment occupation link. And for the erection of new dwellings and modified existing vehicle access, as in the amended scheme. Now, the uh, presenter of this is. Bob Burden. So I'm now handing over to Bob Burden, the case officer, to introduce the item. Thank you very much, Chairman. A little bit of housekeeping to start with. Um, since the agenda was compiled, recommendation A is amended because uh, the Environment Agency of Concerns, they don't have any uh, comments to make and the Natural Environment Team have uh, indicated that the submitted biodiversity plan is now acceptable. So recommendation A, on, as per your update sheet, now reads that the committee be minded to delegate authority to approve to the head of planning, subject to planning conditions and the planning obligation to address an affordable housing contribution of £36,228.62 and that the head of planning determine the application accordingly. Also on your update sheet, there's an additional plan, just a location plan with a red line has been added to your list of uh, plans, Chairman. And also on that update sheet is the updated version of the uh, biodiversity mitigation plan condition to tie in with the submitted acceptable biodiversity mitigation plan. Okay. Okay. Uh, can I confirm? Yes, before you start, Bob, can I confirm with the committee that they've always said, uh, received and read the update sheet related to this item? I take yes, silence yes. as a yes. OK, all right, over to you and Bob, would you make a uh, presentation, please? OK, thank you, Chairman. Right, in terms of the site's location, uh, Charmouth Village is over to the west of this uh, location plan and the A35 actually runs up here so you come off the A35 Charmouth Road takes you into uh, Charmouth Village less than five minutes walk from the application site outlined in red here. Um, this, is, this is also the Stone Barrow Lane which runs up to the coast here alongside the site. Existing vehicular access is at this point here into the site. The Stone Brown Manor, Manor property is here and the Stone Barrow Barn property is there. To the east of the site is the Newlands Holiday Park that's referred to, which you've had uh, some representations from, and uh, several dwellings you can see on the south side of Stone Barrow Lane there. In terms of the layout of the site, as I said, the existing access would be utilised and, and modified as part of the scheme. But, uh, there'd be, there's a substantial area of gravel car parking at the moment in front of the buildings. And that would be retained and slightly extended in that area there, but with a reduced area over here, returning that to grass. Stonebrow Manor here would be subdivided into four dwellings uh, of two and three beds, and it lends itself quite readily to that. And uh, uh, a 1980s large extension at the rear would also become a further dwelling, four bed, with an extension to it on the end, single store extension. Parking, as you can see, uh, alongside dwellings, but also with some 
areas of parking to the frontage too. There is one new build dwelling proposed as part of this scheme that's indicated here, uh, sort of up, upside down layout with the um, bedrooms at ground floor and living accommodation more at first floor. Stoneborough Barn is the uh, converted more traditional barn with natural stone. This end of the site, which has the occupancy condition that's referred to in the report, which uh, part of which the application seeks to lift that uh, employment occupancy condition on that building. There are a number of trees around the site. This boundary is quite heavily treed with uh, mainly mature sycamore trees. There are TPOs within the site. Uh, particularly a large group TPO down in this area here. Um, and as part of this scheme, it's uh, transpired that there, there are certain trees uh, that are now rather um, senile and, and in some cases so suffering from problems. In particular, there's a T1 here, a horse chestnut, which is TPO'd at the moment, but there's substantial uh, rigidoporous uh, basal fungi on it. So um, that's that's one which we would be prepared to uh, have removed from the TPO subject to a replacement tree being planted and that's covered in the planning conditions. Also, it's transpired from our tree officer that there's a couple of additional trees that should be made TPOs as part of this scheme. Uh, one is the ash tree located here and another is an ash tree located here. So those now have TPOs on them. the existing elevations of the, the manor building. Uh, this is the front elevation here, quite an interesting historic building, not listed, not in the conservation area, but nevertheless a building of some character. Nice bit of water tabling detailing on the roof and a nice, nice appearance to it with a central porch there. Um, there would be uh, an additional pitched roof added to this end of the building and a first floor extension at this end which would actually improve the symmetry of the overall frontage of the building. And you can see there are also uh, the existing uh, French windows along, along here, so it lends itself quite readily to, to potential subdivision. It's the rear of the building, which has a first floor jetted element to it, in some character. And then on the end elevation facing Stone Barrel Lane, this is where we'd have a first floor extension with a pitched roof added there. And as part of the scheme, the link to the rear outshoot extension here would be removed to to bring that into uh, use as a separate dwelling, uh, four bedroom dwelling there. So yeah, on the, on the proposed elevations, as I said, pitched roof onto there, first floor extension onto there. Um, that shows the pitched roof element from the, the lane, um, severing the link between the, the building and the extension plus an extension, ground floor extension uh, to the um, rear element there. The proposed new building, that's the uh, front elevation is shown here. Uh, a more contemporary design this, but uh, of, a, of a comparable scale and smaller massing than the uh, more traditional buildings either side of it. But we think that would sit quite comfortably within the the context of the site. I've used fairly traditional finishes though, render, timber cladding on the sides, slate roof, so uh, acknowledging the appropriate materials palette. And in terms of street scenes, that's the existing street scene from Charmouth Road. See the, the manor there, the barn there. So in the proposal, you see that the um, the new build dwelling would sit with a good uh, appreciable distance separation between the existing buildings and is comparable in in uh, in scale and uh, slightly smaller in mass. So we think that would be sit quite comfortably within that context. And that's the, the view from Stone Barrow Lane where clearly the first floor extension element would be there and the single story extension element would be there. So just to give you a context, this is Charmouth. Uh, road just sweeping around from the A35 to go into the village off in this direction. Stone Barrow Lane running up towards the coast there. So as I mentioned, a number of mature trees on the site subject to a group TPO. Quite a, a variety of trees, but these are uh, a tree officer may well look at some 
sort of uh, changes here as part of the, the scheme. Uh, there will be 22 trees planted as part of this, this uh, scheme uh, from uh, current indications. So that just gives you that context of the site is in there. And then just moving just slightly along the Charmouth Road towards the A35. That's the, uh, the Manor House building there. Obviously, you can see some building works have been carried on recently. And the reason for that is because the new owner has found on investigation that uh, the building has been neglected for quite some years and is deteriorating. And there's quite a lot of uh, uh, rotting timber in there in the roof and the floors. And it has been necessary to remove the um, the uh, very low pitched roof there because that was that was in danger of collapse anyway. There's been some internal just stripping out to 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 just establish the extent of works that, that would be necessary for any works to the building. So just to clarify that uh, position for you. That's the um, barn at the far end of the site, Stoneborough Barn, which has the occupancy condition on it. This is uh, an ash tree which now has a, a TPO imposed on it. Uh, just uh, opposite side of view of the, from the road. The, the site of the manor house there, extension at the rear there, on there, would be a, it would be a, a new native species hedge planted along the frontage here, just behind the fence, and then coming along the higher level here, which would be quite a, a, a useful addition to the site. And the vehicular access here, existing vehicular access would be used. This would be slightly uh, improved in terms of visibility. Uh, by just sort of slightly cutting back above 0.6 metres, the vegetation on, on both sides of the access. So uh, that, that's something that uh, the Highway Authority are content with and uh, have recommended conditions consistent with that improvement to visibility display there. Uh, just coming up Stone Barrow Lane, looking back at the rear of the building, just gives you a feel for, for that. So this uh, natural stone, Historic wall garden area would be retained as, as and subdivided to, to form two gardens for two of the dwellings. And this extension at the rear here would be one of the dwellings with its garden over into this area. Here. So that's the end of that extension I just referenced, and that would be its garden area here. And you can see here the, the extent of uh, and height and spread of the mainly sycamore mature trees that run along the back boundary with the Newlands Holiday Park there. Just a quick shot of the main dwelling there, just showing usefully how its potential subdivision is aided by the presence of the French doors on the front elevation there. Uh, just giving you a view from the access through into the site, you know, give you a feel for the extent of uh, existing car parking area that is available in addition to that associated with the dwellings themselves. And this would be the site of the new build dwelling and this is a, a tree which has recently been TPO, an ash tree which has recently been subject to a TPO, which would be, uh, um, you know, the new dwelling would be positioned in such a way that it would not uh, be detrimental to that tree. And then the other new TPO is on this one here. And they've also shown here the relationship with the, um, which is mentioned in correspondence by the owners of Newlands Holiday Park next door. They have their uh, sort of maintenance. Um, and recycling yard just over the, the wall here from the site. Um, that's an existing situation which has been present for, for many years. Um, I've looked at the site from both from within Newland Solidity Park and from within the application site, and I don't see a problem with uh, a continuing relationship. I mean, this is used as a dwelling at the moment. If this proposal is acceptable, it would still be a dwelling, albeit without the occupancy condition on it. There are only two very small windows in the gable end facing onto the yard and those serve WCs. So I don't see a, a particular difficulty in terms of the relationship in residential amenity terms with that maintenance yard and storage area next door. Uh, so just an overhead view so that, that maintenance yard and storage area is there. Maintenance uh, servicing building there, some outside storage of recycling materials etc here. In that yard and then moving down in the Newlands Holiday Park area, you've got parking areas down here and then in this area adjacent to the end of our application site there's a sort of uh, horticultural storage and composting area uh, which that's used for. 
and you see Stonebarrow Lane feeding down here, existing access through there. This is obviously the, the manor house itself and the uh, Stonebarrow barn there. So main planning issues, as I, I've detailed in my report, we consider the principle a bit to be acceptable. It's a location that is outside, but very close to the defined development boundary of Charmouth. Sustainable location, Charmouth has a lot of facilities and, uh, and shops and facilities available within the town within short walking distance. Um, our five year housing land supply position is also testament to why this should be a, a, a good site, uh, particularly as it largely involves uh, reuse of existing buildings rather than putting up new buildings. On visual amenity, the site was within the Heritage Coast and the AONB. But uh, with the approach to uh, design, materials and siting, we consider those would have an acceptable visual impact on the character of the area. And the same with the heritage assets, the, the two older buildings on the site are very much respected by the new build element and by the, the alterations just to the manor house in uh, your officer's view. Residential amenity, I just talked about that in relation to the neighbouring Newlands Holloway Park. I think it's an acceptable relationship uh, with that adjacent usage and the relationship between the um, existing and proposed dwellings on the site is acceptable in terms of amenity. Flood risk and drainage, um, it's within largely within flood risk zone one, the lowest risk area with a very small bit of the lowest part of the site in zone two. But uh, no, no uh, significant issues from consultees on that uh, and certain relevant drainage, um, surface water drainage and collected surface water conditions are applied to the um, recommendation. Land stability, it's within uh, land stability zone three, the highest risk zone. Uh, we do have a, a land stability report to do the application that has been referred to uh, building control officer and to our uh, project engineer and they are satisfied that uh, the development is acceptable subject to following the recommendations in the land stability report. Ecology and I refer to the uh, biodiversity mitigation plan which is now being submitted and approved by the natural environment team so that's satisfactory and in highways I referred to the highway authority as being in support of the scheme subject to relevant conditions on parking, turning, visibility displays and no gates that would obstruct access into the site. The recommendation chairman, as is set out in full on your update sheet um, and the recommendation A, um, and of course there's also the uh, recommendation uh, and the recommendation B, Again, uh, it's, it, this is one there where that's about the progression of the um, 106 in a, a timely manner to secure the uh, contribution towards affordable housing. So the, the conditions I've listed there are very much the sort of conditions you would expect uh, in a, a, a relatively modest scheme of residential development. I'll just uh, pick out that one there. Uh, I've removed PD rights on alterations to the front of the manor because I think, I think it's important if you're subdividing that, that we retain an overall coherence to the appearance of that to just make sure that that's uh, carefully controlled if there were to be any any uh, alterations to the front of the, the manor house. And uh, I think Chairman, that uh, concludes my presentation. I recommend that you, the committee be minded to delegate authority to approve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Rob. Right, I understand we have got some written statements to be read out, so I now invite Zoe Linton to read those statements uh, uh, as they were submitted to Democratic Services. Over to you, Zoe. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Charmouth Parish Council. The Charmouth Parish Council would reiterate the comments made previously as follows. The Parish Council is pleased that the issue of overdevelopment has been addressed by the reduction of two of the proposed dwellings. However, there is concern that this scheme is proposing 100% open market housing, and it is felt that there should be an apportionment calculation in line with paragraph 30 of NPPF 2021. 
NPPF 2021 paragraph 64 indicates that on developments in designated rural areas, including AONBs, affordable homes can be sought below the national threshold of 10 units, a major development, i.e. normally five to nine units. The Parish Council is also concerned about the access and visibility in line with the Highway Authority's comments, given the number of vehicles that will be using the site on a daily basis. In addition, the comments were made by Parish Council in relation to application number PMPO 2021-03556, which it is felt should be considered in conjunction with the above application. The Parish Council believe this restriction should be considered alongside that current application PFUL 2021-00554, which if approved would then need to be removed. However, if the application is refused, a new proposal would be required and the removal of this con condition should be judged against that proposal e.g. the manor could get sold to another holiday accommodation oper operator and this restriction could remain relevant. Otherwise, it could end up with the barn becoming an unrestricted normal house before plans for the rest of the site are determined. Applicant. The purchasers and developers of Stone Barra Manor have a long association and a strong affection for the area, having spent decades both living and holidaying in the area. Background. The history of Stone Barrow Manor includes being a home in the 1600s, through to a school, hotel and latterly a large group holiday letting business. Unfortunately, the demand and relevancy of this large group service model has declined considerably as demonstrated by the trading accounts, which suggest that Stone Barrow Manor had only been fully occupied to the equivalent of 20 weeks of the year before the COVID pandemic hit. Consequently, this has resulted in an unsuitable, underutilised and poorly maintained 18 bedroom facility. Unsustainable business and deteriorating buildings. Poor business performance from the large group's holiday letting model had consistently resulted in a limited budget for adequate and appropriate maintenance of a large characterful building. In, examples include flat felt roofing, roof slates not being replaced and stubs, substandard heating and plumbing systems and a low grade facility. The manor house needs and deserves to be upgraded to a modern to modern standards and given the development investment to maintain its character and be converted to more relevant much needed homes so it can stand proudly in its location for many more decades environmentally outdated the current fossil fuel heating system using oil is no longer appropriate along with poor insulation insulation the proposal to move to efficient contemporary heating, upgraded insulation, along with solar panels, where effective, is important. Additional improvements include provision of electric vehicle charging ports to meet future requirements. Underused land and economic benefit. Currently two buildings standing on a very large 1.2 acre site and have generated very limited economic benefit to the community with low levels of occupancy. Providing a mix of two, three and four bedroom homes, 52 weeks of the year will not only offer vital housing, but will provide much needed economic support in form of affordable housing contribution, community infrastructure, infrastructure levy, council tax, 
from additional homes and seven families spending locally in addition to local builder and maintenance employment opportunities. Stone Barrow Manor urgently needs the development investment this plan proposes to bring a distinctive and prominent local landmark back to life, to offer the community enhanced economic benefit and to make it, it sustainable for many decades to come. That's all, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adesia. I'm now going to hand back to uh, Bob Burden for, uh, uh, to respond with any salient points you may wish to clarify. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, there are a few points I'd like to make, uh, particularly in relation to the to Charmouth Parish Council's observations. They, they reference uh, affordable housing, and uh, as my report indicates, affordable housing is actually taken to, into account with this site. The council's policy on relatively small residential sites like this is not to seek on-site actual provision, uh, where we've got schemes between uh, six and nine units, but to take a uh, affordable housing contribution, a financial sum for that. And that has been calculated at 30, uh, just over £36,000. So th there would be a contribution towards affordable housing from this scheme that would then be available for use in the locality to help with affordable housing provision. And we'd secure that through uh, an appropriate planning obligation, Chairman. Um, as regards vehicular access, uh, as I mentioned in my, my report, the access to the site um, is uh, an existing one. Uh, that's good. My screen has frozen up. Uh, <laughs> I was going to take you to the uh, photo of the access, but uh, if you recall the photo of the access you've seen, um, the existing access would be modified by visibility splays, slightly improving visibility uh, on, on uh, emerging from that access on both sides, such that that it would be cleared um, uh, above 0.6 metres either side of the access, just, just to improve a little bit of visibility coming out of there. Uh, and that's um, uh, something that the Highway Authority support. They would also look for a condition which would provide the parking and turning on site and no gates should be erected that would obstruct uh, use of the access. So it does have the support of the Highway Authority. Obviously their comments are uh, uh, are also partly influenced by the fact that the site has an existing traffic credit uh, because um, if you have an, an 18 bed facility plus another dwelling on the site, obviously that has a, a traffic credit attached to it. Um, the Parish Council make reference to another application for removing the section 106 on the barn. Now that is an application which is pending at the moment, isn't, isn't yet ready for uh, recommendation or determination, but that, that um, application the the barn the barn here has it was belt and braced back in 2000 and 2001 that sort of time by both a planning condition controlling the occupancy and also a 106 to control the occupancy so that they're dealt with by separate applications the you're not considering the the legal agreement 106 today the committee are considering lifting the occupancy planning condition on the barn um, which requires that one person is employed at least part time in um, servicing the holiday accommodation. Now, as I detailed in, in para 13.13 of my report, circumstances have changed in planning terms since 2001 quite a bit. Uh, several points. Under current practice, we would not normally require an on-site employment related unit to service a unit of holiday accommodation. Uh, secondly, the employment provided is very minimal. It's not a significant sized employment site. It simply allows for one part time worker to to be in there to service the holiday accommodation specifically on this site. So there's little employment benefit available from it in any event. Three, it's a sustainable location. Uh, of the existing building means it's current. It means it meets current policy for being an unfettered dwelling in any event. And uh, last but not least, the manor house, there's no policy to require its retention as a holiday unit. So on that basis, that there's no, no need to retain the occupancy condition on, on the barn. 
So for those reasons, um, as I say, uh, I, I, I'm supporting this application uh, in, in its various respects. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed, Bob. OK, committee, are there any questions of a technical nature for the case officer? Yes, yes, Chair, Paul Kimber. Paul, Paul Kimber, Chairman. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Chair, I just wonder if you can show us that, uh, Bob can show us that uh, one of the original slides uh, on the new build. It's just a technical question I wanted to ask around the character of uh, Stone Barrow Manor and the new build, uh, whether we should have tried to, to have got mu much more of a within keeping of, the, of that. You know, quite rightly, you said it's not a, um, a listed building, but it's a, a building of character. And I just wonder whether the other buildings should have somehow reflected it. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yes, if you'd like to respond. Uh, unfortunately, my screen is completely frozen. I can't uh, I can't move back to the the um, diagram to show that and I can't escape from the um, slide I've got in there at the moment. But yeah, as you'll uh, as I showed on the street scene, um, the existing natural stone barn here that has a, a, a simple pitched roof on it uh, aligned that way. Obviously, you've seen photos of the manor house here, which is a, a white finished render with natural slate roof. And yes, you're right, the, the proposed dwelling has an a slightly asymmetrical um, uh, pitched roof to it. But the scale, as you'll have seen from the, as you can see from the, uh, the footprint here, is 11 metres distance between that and the new, new build element there. It, it, its height is not, um, it's about the same as the barn and slightly lower than the, the height of the manor house. Um, and clearly the fenestration and that, it, it's a more sort of contemporary uh, aesthetic. Um, so um, yes, it is a more modern design, but I think because the, the, the massing of it and the scale and height are reduced relative to that of the two existing buildings either side, I think it would would sit satisfactorily within that context. And there, there is a although there's a difference in design, there's a link in terms of materials because the use of uh, a similar colour render to the manor house, uh, sort of off white, coupled with timber cladding on the sides and a slate roof would really help to sort of um, uh, establish a, 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 a visual language in terms of materials that would be consistent uh, on the site, uh, Chairman. No, I still can't move. Are you happy with that? Yes, Chair. Yes, Chair. It's just uh, uh, um, probably I've sat on planning too long. Um, uh, I, I, I just wonder what efforts there was, but uh, no, I, I, I'm, sat I, I'm satisfied with that answer. That's fine. OK. OK, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Kimber. Councillor Pike, are there any more technical questions? No, Chairman. You're free to open the debate. OK, all right. Uh, uh, I now open the debate to members. Have we got who's first to speak? Nobody, Chairman. Right. OK, so I recommend we move to the recommendation. I'll propose. Are you going to propose, Bill? Yeah, I'll, I'll second that, Chairman. Okay. Councillor O'Leary. Councillor O'Leary to, to second, Chairman. <coughs> Can I, can I clarify that that uh, you are proposing and seconding the amended recommendation uh, recommendation A as per the update sheet, together yes. with recommendation B on the on the on the on the papers? Yes, indeed. Councillor O'Leary. Yep, happy with that, Chairman. Okay, thank you very much indeed. In that case, then, um, um, if um, uh, if there's no more deliberation and members are content that have heard the entire presentation debate, I will make a mind. I will uh, take a vote to make a minded to resolution by roll call. And so I will start off with Councillor Dave Bowler. Minded to approve, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Kelvin Clayton. Yeah, approve, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Susan Cochin. Sorry, had problems unmuting. Uh, approved, Chair. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah, did, was that approval, Susan? Yeah, sorry, Chair. Yeah, approved, Chair. Yep. Thank you. Councillor Dean Dunsef? Approved, Chair. Thank you. For clarity, Councillor Bill Pipe? For Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nick Arland? Approved, Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Paul Kimber? Uh, for Chair. Thank you. For clarity, Councillor O'Leary? For Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Weller? For. Thank you. And Councillor John Burr? Uh, for Chairman. And I'm also for. So that again is unanimous. Thank you for that. Is everyone happy to continue or does anyone want to break? Sorry, Chair, could I just, could I just remind you to, to pull me in on the um the, the decision? Oh, 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 Chairman, oh, yes. I'm sorry, sorry, Mike. Um, no, it's uh, easily done. Senior <laughs> moment again. <laughs> I now I now ask Mike Garrity to make the formal decision on this item. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I can confirm that I've listened to the, the officer presentation, heard the debate, and that this application be determined in line with the committee's minded to decision. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. OK, everyone happy to continue? Uh, five minutes would be welcome, Chairman. If, if we talk yeah, that would, I'd appreciate it as well, because I need to reboot my, my, you know, my quality of my, uh, my uh, connection is pretty bad and I keep on dropping out. So yes, yeah, yes, please. Can we therefore have a five minute break and I will uh, uh, reconvene just after half past uh, half past 11. Is everyone in agreement with that? Thank you, Chair. Any okay. dissenters? No, Thank you, that's good, Chairman. Happy Chair. OK, that's fine then. In that case, then I'll just have a break for five minutes so I can reboot. Thank you, everyone. See you in a moment.
Right. <laughs> Everyone back in building now? You're on mute. Uh, I'm not sure, Chairman. You may have to take a roll call. OK. Just for clarity. <clears throat> right, committee, I just wanted to check if everyone's present. Uh, uh, Councillor Bowell, are you present? Present, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Clayton? I'm here, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Cocking? Yes, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Dunsir. Here, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Ireland. Present. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kimber. Yes, here, Chair. OK, Councillor O'Leary. Come back, back to you, Chairman. Come back to you, uh, Louis. Uh, Councillor Kate Weller. Come back to you, Kate. Uh, Councillor John Ware. Uh, present, Chairman. Thank you. I just double check with the uh, Councillor Weller and Councillor O'Leary. I have, I have just texted Councillor O'Leary, Chairman. Okay. Hopefully, I will I... when he rejoins the meeting. <laughs> Your, uh, place yourself. Right, uh, I'll give him a few moments. Okay, thank you. Councillor Kemba, can you turn your microphone off, please? Thank you. Is he on the is he on the list? Look. I didn't want to do that, but I, I think uh, hopefully I've got a better connection now. Uh Council Leary's not oh yes he's oh he's, he's in but he's muted. Council Leary, Councillor Weller. Can you unmute Councillor O'Leary, please, and confirm your attendance? Likewise, Councillor Weller, I believe she's present as well. I am. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kate. Councillor, Sorry, I'm back. Councillor O'Leary was, was not um, taking part in this discussion. I am, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, Are I'm you back? That's right. That's... Just no, this is the Kirkleton Avenue uh, application. This is not the... the... Yep. Yeah. Sorry, my apologies, uh, Vice right. Chairman. That's all right. Okay. OK, right, OK, we're all personally correct. I do apologise about that. Uh, I, I'm hopefully now got a much better connection and it give you a little bit of a break. We're now going to take item 4C on the agenda, and that's PFUL 2021-2021-02664, which is 10 Kirkleton Avenue, Weymouth, Dorset, DT4 7PT. And that is the change of use from a Class C2 residential institution to a class C3 residential dwelling house and C4A houses in multiple occupancy. I now invite the uh, case officer, uh, uh, Thomas Wild, to introduce this item. Over to you, Thomas. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just share my screen, if I may, um, with my presentation. Um, can I just check you can see my screen with the presentation on there? We can, thank you. Yep, OK. Um, so. Right, yes, um, application reference P slash FUL slash 2021 slash 02664 10 Kirtleton Avenue, Weymouth for the change of use from Class C2 residential institution to Class C3 residential dwelling houses um, and C4A houses in multiple occupation. Um, the application is submitted by the council um, and it's specifically for the creation of um, housing for uh, care leavers, which is is not not necessarily clear from the description of development. Um, the site location is as shown on the slide here, um, outlined in red. Uh, this is Kirtleton Avenue, 
Uh, we have Dorchester Road leading into Weymouth um, to the Esplanade uh, to the south here, uh, and we have the beach over to the east. Um, and if I skip on this, just zooms in a little bit, um, we can see we've got Park Lane, which is a one-way street which runs to the rear of the site, um, and these are um, residential cottages which back onto the site um, in fronting Park Lane. Um, this is an aerial photograph of the site um, as it as it currently is. Um, the the application uh, building here is a relatively modern block um, fronting uh, to Kirtleton Avenue. Um, we've got the cottages to the rear here, um, which themselves are modern. Um, there is uh, access down through to a rear parking and servicing area, parking on the frontage and a, an external amenity area here. Um, if I just, this is a street view of the site. Um, you can see quite a modern construction with gabled frontage. This uh, just to the left hand side of the photograph is the vehicular access down to the rear servicing area. Um, the land falls away towards the rear there, so there is a uh, lower ground floor. Um, the main um, entrance to the building is through these double doors here, and there is also a secondary access into the side of the building. Um, so the proposal is, as we say, for the construction, uh, for the change of use, sorry, of the building to um, residential for care leavers. Um, there are no external changes to the um, building, so it's all, all internal works um, and fit out with the change of use. Um, this shows the ground floor of the building, um, which will be given over to um, communal spaces in the front part of the building. So we have a communal kitchen and dining area here for residents with a communal lounge, corridor, storeroom, um, shower WC and post room. Um, there's actually a uh, FOB security access uh, doors here and here, which um, uh, limit access into the rear part of the building, which will be um, which will provide a training kitchen and flexible space for council staff to provide um, support activities for the residents. So um, it, it's about um, providing a transition from for care leavers into independent living. Um, so moving on to the first and second floor plans, they're very similar to, to one another. Um, basically, there's 12 bedrooms utilising the existing bed, bedroom spaces for the for the former care use. Um, the each bedroom with ensuite uh, facilities um, for kitchen and for communal kitchen and dining spaces per um, floor and it, each there are secure doors um, here and here and here and here which um, basically divide the building uh, front to rear so there's there is an element of division within the building and, and compartmentalization um, the the existing core of the building provides the access so there is there are stairs to each floor but and also a lift um, and there is also a, a lower ground floor which I don't have the plans for um, in this presentation but there, there's effectively no changes to that so there's a there's a plant room bin and cycle storage and a rear access with um, to provide access into the um, the ground floor uh, sorry the the amenity space at the rear um, the main issues identified, we have the principle of development. Um, there is the loss of a care use um, at present. Uh, the, the care use is not active at the moment. The, the building is vacant. Um, so it's considered that, that although that the lawful use of the site is care, there is it doesn't really make a contribution to care provision at present. Um, and the loss of that is balanced by the significant benefit that would be achieved by providing specialist accommodation for care leavers, which is is has been identified um, as a priority by the council in its uh, care leaver strategy. Um, the scale, design, and impact on the character of the area. Um, as I've mentioned, there would be no external changes to the building. Um, there, there, all the changes are internal only, so there isn't any any particular impact upon impact um, on character. Um, Similarly, with amenity, um, the 
there are no additional impacts identified um, from overlooking overbearing or loss of light given that there are no physical changes to the building and while there would be a change to the nature of the use the setting of the site is largely residential um, in its character so the, the use is considered appropriate to that setting um, just moving on highways and parking um, there's been no objection from the highways authority um, they have recommended conditions um, which require the off-road parking spaces to be retained um, and, and, and kept available <coughs> and for the secure cycle <coughs> parking to be provided prior to any occupation of the building. Um, and it just in terms of impacts on habitat sites, um, as the site is within five kilometres of the Chesil and the Fleet um, habitat sites um, and a habitat regulations um, assessment screening has been undertaken and confirmed that there would be no likely significant effects on the habitat sites um, that have been identified. Uh, therefore, just moving on, the recommendation is that the committee be minded to grant planning permission uh, today, subject to recommended, recommended conditions in the committee report, which are for three years for implementation, approved plans list, um, and the conditions recommended by the Highways Authority for the turning and parking uh, spaces to be provided and retained and for the cycle parking to be provided prior to occupation. And that concludes my presentation, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Thomas. That, that's a, a brilliant presentation. Uh, are there any questions of a technical nature for the case officer? Councillor Kimber may have a, a technical question. He's not indicated that he has yeah. it as, as an RTS. Paul. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, just a question on parking. Um, is there any plans for charging points in the parking area? And that back. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, there, there isn't anything in the um, in the plans to indicate charging. Yeah, there isn't anything in the plans to indicate charging points are be, being provided as as part of the scheme. No. Anything to add or is there an, any other technical question? No, no more technical questions, Chairman. If you were going to open the debate, uh, oh, you may wish to call Councillor Weller first. Anyone wishing to speak, uh, Bill? Councillor Weller, Chairman. OK, go ahead, um, uh, uh, Councillor Weller. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Um, first of all, um, I, I, I omitted to declare a uh, non-pecuniary interest in this item at the start, for which I apologise. Um, my interest is that I'm the chairman of the Corporate Parenting Board, and obviously this is a significant part of our, our current work on providing... I do apologise. Providing um, moving on accommodation for our children in care. Um, we've spent a good deal of time uh, uh, planning this and we've worked very hard on it on in terms of um, uh, charging points, although I think it is something that we 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 might consider um, the cars parked there will be staff rather than residents um, absolutely for the most most part um, and those staff will be coming and going all of the time so it's not quite so relevant um, but I would like to recommend that we approve we're doing some terrific work particularly in Weymouth for our, our children in care and for our care leavers. And as I said earlier, this is all part of that project um, and a very important part. And a lot of work has been done on the planning. Uh, it's a great, it's going to be a great facility for our young people. So I'd like to propose that we accept. Uh, thank you, Wella. Uh, uh, Councillor Wella, um, your declaration is non pecuniary, so that entitles you to participate and vote in the in the uh, uh, debate Thank uh, you. and, uh, and uh, I note your your uh, proposal. Right, who, who else have we got to speak? Um, uh, Councillor Nick Ireland, Chairman. Yeah, uh, I was just going to speak to second. So. You're going to second. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, Hannah Massey, Chairman. Hannah, you might like to make a comment. 
Uh, yes, Chairman, I just wanted to um, confirm with Councillor Weller that she doesn't feel that her non-pecuniary interest in the matter um, has led her to predetermination. Could you add that please, uh, Councillor? Um, no, I don't believe it has, Hannah. Um, I, 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 I have been involved in the earlier discussions, but I have no no pecuniary interest um, uh, other than that. Uh, I, I do believe um, providing for our care leavers is important wherever it is. So, are you happy with that, Hannah? Uh, I, I am happy. Yes. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, Jean Duns Councillor Jean Dunseith, Chairman, would also like to have second, but I believe she's been pipped to the post. But Jean may well wish to comment. OK, uh, Councillor Dunseith, do you make, wish to make a comment? Um, thank you, Chairman. Oh, I don't know what's going on. No, I think I think this um, this would be a great help to our young care leavers, our young people in Weymouth and the surrounding area and uh, I fully support this um, application. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. OK, do we have any other speakers? Uh, uh, just just a comment from myself and a right on the hammer again, Councillor Paul Kimber. Uh, my point is that as it's a Dorset Council owned building, um, I, I believe the premises will likely appear on uh, list B for electrical vehicle charging points. Uh, that's all I had to say, but Councillor Paul Kimber has something to say. OK, over to you, Paul. Oh, uh, thank you very much. You uh, beat, beat me to it. Uh, yeah, I'm absolutely delighted to support this, <coughs> given our workshop yesterday, and this is so, so badly needed. Um, I, I can say I feel as though I've achieved something today. Thank you. Oh, good. Fantastic. Do we have any other speakers, Bill? No, that's it, Chairman. You can move to the vote. OK, right. OK. Um, where are we? Let me just get my... If there's no more deliberation and members are content that they have heard the entire presentation debate, I will now take a vote uh, to make a minded to resolution by rate roll call. And I'll start off with... Uh, Councillor Bowell. Councillor Bowell. Minded to approve, Chair. Thank you very much, Steve. Councillor uh, Clayton. Uh, support, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Cocking. Minded to approve, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Dancy. Approved, Chair. Uh, Councillor Bill Pike. Very much in favour, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, for clarity, Councillor Nick Arland. For. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Paul Kimber. Delighted to uh, support, Chair. Good, lovely. Councillor Louis O'Leary. Four, Chairman. Thank you. For clarity, Councillor Kate Weller. Four. Thank you. And, and Councillor John Worth. Minded to approve, Chairman. And I approve as well. That again is unanimous. Thank you. Don't forget the minded to. Uh, oh. <laughs> Thank Chairman. you. <laughs> Just get one I out of three. I now ask Mike Garrity to make the formal decision on this item. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Yes, I can confirm that I've listened to the officer presentation, heard the debate um, and the, the technical questions, and I'm, I'm that the application will be determined in line with the committee's minded to decision. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, that concludes the planning applications uh, <coughs> on the agenda. Uh, and so now we proceed to item five on the agenda, which is HI 1229 Custom House Key Weymouth, Public Realm Enhancements, uh, to consider report by the Executive Director of Place. Now I now invite Christopher Peck, which is the Cycling and Walking Officer, to introduce this item, and he will be supported by uh, Andrew Bradley, who is the Project Engineer. So over to you, Christopher. Thank you, Chairman. I'll just um, thank you, members. I'll just share my screen if I can get to it. Can 
Can I confirm that you can see that? We can see the yeah, things. That's good. Thank you. There you go. Okay, so um, I wanted to uh, go through this uh, report into the traffic regulation orders behind the custom house key um, project. Um, as uh, the chair mentioned, um, I'm the cycling walking officer from the transport planning team and um, with me also is Andrew Bradley, who is part of the highways improvements team, who are the team which deliver the schemes on the ground. Um, so just as an overview of the presentation, I'll explain why this has come to committee, which is fairly unusual for traffic regulation orders to appear at committee, then just go into a little bit about the site location, the policy background, why the scheme has come about, some more site photos in addition to this one, a timeline of what's happened so far within the scheme, results of a specific consultation on a con the, the uh, conducted amongst the wider public in January and February of this year, some scheme drawings of the scheme as it was originally promoted, um, a description of some of the, the surfaces being used and also the equalities impact um, assessments that we've examined for this. And then finally, just a, a, a summary of, of the, the responses to the traffic regulation order consultation, which was conducted in the summertime. So why are we why we bring this to committee? Why do we need to bring this to, to committee? And what specifically are we talking about? There are two traffic regulation orders which were consulted on or, or draft orders which were put out to consultation. One is the removal of um, one hour parking and 13 residence parking bays on Custom House Key to replace with loading bays and disabled parking bays. And the second one around allowing contraflow cycling on Custom House Key to enable uh, in, an, in an easterly direction. But in general, uh, TROs are dealt with directly by the portfolio holder without going to committee. But we usually only receive a handful of responses to each of these. Uh, in this case, we had a very large number of responses because it's a high profile scheme and there'd already been a wide scale application. And we had 113 responses, which I'll go into at the, at the end of the report explaining. But many of these were objections to, to both the, the two uh, orders which we consulted on. So the recommendations in summary which you have in the report which you've um, read is that to proceed with the TRO and the parking element that is removal of the parking that's there at the moment, the provision of loading bays to support the visitors. This is to enable that public realm scheme to go ahead but on the second one is not to proceed with the TRO enabling contraflow cycling on the custom house key. So just as a uh, explanation of, of where we're talking about for those who are unfamiliar with it, which I, I, I doubt many are. The Custom House Key runs for about 400 metres um, at its eastern extent with the junction with the Esplanade at the pavilion on the peninsula. Um, and uh, traffic is then uh, westbound only up to the Town Bridge and St Mary Street. In terms of the policy background behind why the scheme came about, in 2015, the um, Weymouth and Portland Borough Council, as then was, produced a, a supplementary planning document on the Town Centre Master Plan, which outlined several um, designs for public realm improvements and a, and a better uh, provision for walking and cycling in the town. Um, we then built on that with the Western Dorset Economic Growth Corridor Studies in 2019, which were then published. These are three documents, one around a public realm strategy, one around a general transport strategy and one around a parking strategy. And these had specific recommendations around the creating more space for outdoor seating associated with venues serving food and drink, such as along Custom House Key, and, and other steps around how we improve the public realm, for, particularly for those people with limited mobility, um, disabilities and walking and cycling in the area. On the parking side, we also, from that the same packages of, of, of studies, we had a specific recommendation to remove the visitor parking from Custom House Quay uh, and indeed on Trinity Road to reduce search trips uh, in this area. We, we know there's a large number of, of um, people who are visiting the, the town locally who know that there was there was um, one hour's free parking allowed in this area and would circulate creating a large number of, of uh, vehicle movements in the area. So just a, a few site photos setting in context. This is looking um, west. This is in September 2020 coming out of, of Google Street View, um, showing where the, the parking extended to opposite the junction with Maiden Street. Um, there's also a, a loading bay which is visible in that location. Um, 
and uh, it, it shows the amount of space available uh, for the various users in terms of the sitting out area, which was unavailable, a, a fairly narrow footway in this area and a very small footway on the southern side adjacent to the harbour wall. Uh, this is looking east at the East Street Junction, showing um, the, the problem we have with overhanging vehicles, which reduced the, the size of the, the footway in this location again, which is quite a narrow footway. Uh, and then this is looking at in July 2021 of this year after a temporary scheme had been uh, put in, which approximates the uh, permanent scheme, which which is uh, being suggested uh, as part of the consultation we did in the winter. So we, we did not have time to to install the whole scheme. Obviously, that's not that stage. But this was essentially showing um, the how the space could be allocated and um, the where additional sitting out areas on the northern side for the hospitality businesses there would, would be located. Um, again, uh, just looking west from the South Parade Junction at a slightly less busy time uh, and again showing where some of the loading bays are located to um, assist with the access to the harbour side businesses, both the, on the frontages on the north side, but also the, uh, the vessels which are berthed here as well. And again, just uh, another just photo just showing the sort of diversity of uses which has uh, emerged since the scheme has gone in. Um, finally, in this location, we, we you know we have added a little bit of temporary additional street furniture, and this would be something that could be put in as part of the permanent scheme um, with the TRO to be proceeded with. So just again to reiterate that timeline, um, February of last year, we received funding from the Department of Transport and Network Rail of around £1.3 million to remove the rail, um, you know, the defunct unused rails in this location up to the King Street Junction. Um, and uh, then over the summer, we obviously had the COVID pandemic and we had the request from the businesses there to uh, improve the situation and to, to improve the situation for social distancing. So a temporary vehicle restriction was put in in various roads on the uh, on uh, in the harbour to restrict access to certain vehicles, but some other vehicles were allowed. Um, that was taken out in September um, when we had Dorset Cabinet um, Council Cabinet approval for the rail removal works to commence, which they did shortly thereafter and took place um, throughout the, the winter time. In January, we consulted on the, the permanent public realm scheme. And uh, in March, we put in that temporary layout, uh, which was essentially to, to show people what it, it might look like. Um, and then finally, we, we started the, the traffic regulation order, formal consultation on the, the legal orders that we're talking about now in, in July of this year. Uh, and then um, last month, we, we started work on, on this, the permanent scheme, uh, starting at the, the far western extent, which is unaffected by um, the traffic regulation order. <laughs> So just to summarise the, the, the consultation exercise that uh, we conducted in the winter, we had 1400 responses to this. In general, 58% uh, of respond respondents were in favour of the scheme and 22% were against it. A further 20% um, had reservations or, or um, had agreements subject to, to further discussions uh, or further detail. There was one element of the, the various aspects that we suggested where we had a, a, a more negative response where we had 50% against and only 40% in favour and that was this concept of installing a contraflow on road cycle lane towards the pavilion and um, the rest of the items we submitted uh, had a, a, a positive and um, supportive overall uh, response from the public. So just to to um, show a a, uh, a layout of the scheme as it was submitted to the the TRO in the summer, um, to to draw some uh, some attention to this still includes the the contraflow cycle lane as that was the the, um, the submitted scheme, um, but the recommendation as I reiterate is for that um, to be withdrawn. We're also altering um, some of these. Uh, locations of some of these loading bays in discussion with some of the stakeholders, particularly the um, the um, Weymouth and Portland uh, uh, Licensed Boatmen and Fishermen Association um, to provide a, a, a loading bay slightly further in this direction, in a westerly direction, um, to, to enable better access to some of those locations. And we have further discussion with them on, on those issues. And this, this also will move slightly, this loading bay. Um, in terms of the texture of materials, which I'll, I'll come on to in, in a bit, we're proposing a, a slab paving on the northern side here, 
Um, this patched area will be potential areas for sitting out licenses uh, in future. This area is already licensed to the ship, which is the pub in this area, and there are some existing licenses for the establishments in these two locations. But for the rest of the locations along here, which are mostly cafes and restaurants, um, all these um, areas will be new sitting out license areas. Outside this, there will be a, a clear footway of 1.5 to um, in some cases slightly wider than 1.5 meters on the outside of those sitting out areas a clear space for uh, pedestrians to find their way through and on the southern side there will be a, a much wider area than is there presently uh, currently the footway is is around two meters wide although there's a, a lot of a problem with overhanging vehicles uh, and there's a there's quite a lot of there's no segregation between the carriageway and the footway so there's a lot of people who are using it as a a, a kind of a, a temporary or informal loading area um, we're going to regulate that to ensure that the the loading areas are are you know where they need to be for the businesses rather than used in an informal manner which might block key areas of the footway to ensure there is a, a clear route through on the southern side adjacent to the harbour wall. Eastern end um, we will be planning to, to widen the footway slightly in this section between Pilgrim's Way and um, South Parade where it's extremely narrow at the moment and there'll be an additional sitting out license in this area at the back of the um, Baptist Church in this location. Um, the, the area of Custom House Quay from South Parade um, heading in a westerly direction will be a restricted parking area, so there will be no double yellow lines, um, mainly to enhance the aesthetic uh, look and feel of the area. And there'll be an additional crossing point at uh, this um, eastern extent to link onto the uh, freight platform. In terms of the, the kind of surfaces we will be using, as I said, there'll be slabbing um, matching the existing slabbing on the northern side, buff slabbing. On the southern side, we propose using um, imprint footways, which we've done elsewhere in, in the county. This is in, um, as it's used in Gillingham. This is a, a an asphalt, which is imprinted to um, to, to look like slab paving. Um, and it's, it's, it's pretty effective. It's much more hard wearing than slabbing. It doesn't rock and cause trip hazards and it's a lot cheaper to install. Um, within the carriageway, we propose using a, a similar pattern, but that's using a slightly different material and slightly different color, which is 45 degree herringbone, which would match the same um, approach as used on the other side of the, the harbor and Trinity Road in that area. Uh, so this is an example of a scheme, a similar scheme, which went in in Institute Road in, in Swanage, where the, the herringbone, um, dark herringbone pattern is used on a crossing point here. Um, for the scheme on Custom House Key, we propose using it across the whole of the carriageway. And then the crossing points will be in a slightly different colour again. Um, this is the, the, the buff slabbing that we propose using on the southern footway, again used as an imprint rather than as um, permanent slabs laid. Just to go into the kind of equalities impact side of this, we have um, spoken to users and as part of the January and February exercise, we looked in great detail at the responses from uh, users who had a disability. Um, what we'll be doing for blind and visually impaired users is providing tactile paving on all the crossing points, including the, the um, four new crossing points across Custom House Key. This enables blind and visually impaired users to more easily locate the places where they know they can and direct them to cross. Um, we also obviously be providing wider footways on both the north and south, southern side of the road um, and drop curbs also to help um, people with wheelchairs or mobility impairments to more easily find and um, and cross. Uh, and of course, there'll be additional seating areas, particularly on that harbour wall areas, which helps people with mobility uh, impairments. For blue badge holders, there will be some loss of, of access to short term parking. How we are, however, we are providing dedicated disabled bays um, at the eastern end of Customer House Key, where, and there were none previously in this location or anywhere else. Although, obviously, if people were able to find some parking, that, that served as, uh, as, as disabled parking. Um, and we will make further consideration of where we can provide additional future base as we have as in terms of consultation with those users. And then another protected group which we've made consideration of is, is those of 
older age, maternity and pregnancy, um, where again, we feel that the wider footways we're providing an additional seating, provide greater comfort and ease of movement to, to those users. Just to summarise with the the responses to the the um, consultation on the traffic regulation order, which again is separate from the wider consultation conducted in the winter. Um, on these, we had uh, overall 113 responses. Uh, these were split between the, the two different responses, uh, the two different TROs, one on the controversial cycling and one on the parking. Um, in both cases, we had a, a majority of respondents were uh, were opposed or objected to the proposals um, for a variety of reasons. These are outlined in the report. Um, uh, in, in some cases, there was a bit of duplication. So in terms of the number of responses per household, it was slightly lower than the, the total. Um, uh, but as I say, it, these, some of these issues were around um, specific technical concerns from local residents. Some of them were, were kind of more wider uh, comments that, that we received, which were not particularly related to, to the scheme itself. Um, so yeah, that that is that's the um, some of my uh, report. I just reiterate the recommendation um, that we are asking um, for from committee that having considered the re representations received in response to public advertisement that the committee recommend the approval of the proposed changes to the traffic regulation as advertised for the removal of parking but that having considered the representations received to public advertisement that the committee recommend that the traffic regulation order for the contrary cycle provision does not proceed and there's the, the reasons given there thank you chairman thank you very much indeed christopher uh, I now invite uh, Joe, Taylor, uh, Joe Taylor, who's a trainee engineer, to read the, rep the written statement submitted to Democratic Services. I now Thank hand over to Joe. Thank you, Chairman. My name is Joe Taylor. I'm a trainee engineer working in highway improvements. Two written representations have been received, which read as follows. From Robert Cheeseman. Dorset Council's plan 2020 to 2024 has the climate and ecological emergency at the centre of it. The plan commits to protecting our unique environment by supporting zero emission transportation and building strong healthy communities by providing safe and usable cycleways. Central government is investing in acting travel schemes recognising the associated environmental, health and economic benefits. <clears throat> because of the views of 28 people, the report's recommendation for the Contraflow Cycleway TRO on Custom House Key in Weymouth is not to proceed with the cycleway. There follows two questions from Mr Cheeseman. First question, is the recommendation on this report consistent with Dorset Council's plan 2020 to 2024 and the government's national ambition for walking and cycling active travel. Dorset Council has sensors on many of the existing cycleways around Weymouth. Second question, does the data from these sensors show any trends in the number of journeys by cycle and does this indicate a growing demand for improved cycling infrastructure? And secondly, from Alex Pratt, report gives only two reasons for objection to the contraflow cycle lane out of the seven reasons for the scheme as a whole. These are perceived danger and it is unnecessary. These objections came only from 28 people in a town of 53,128 residents. Both of these reasons are entirely subjective and are fully mitigated in the responses within the report. If local residents are currently unused to having two-way cycling, how are they ever to become used to it if it is never implemented locally, despite contraflow lanes being used safely at thousands of locations across the country? Were any reasons put forward for the lane being unnecessary that outweigh the tangible benefits of active travel, a coherent and safe network for cycling and provision for future users of micro mobility solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, uh, Joe. Thank you for the, uh, reading those statements. Before I continue, could I ask whether Councillor John Orrell is now present at the meeting? Uh, 
believe he's not there for. I believe he was intending to make a statement. Right, OK. Uh, I now call on uh, Christopher Peck or Andrew Bradley to respond with any salient points they may wish to clarify to those uh, written submissions. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I can respond in brief if that's uh, acceptable, particularly to um, Mr Cheeseman's second question. Um, on his first question, which is, is a recommendation consistent with the plan um, for the government's national ambition for walking, cycling and active travel, um, this scheme clearly is, is a benefit in terms of uh, assisting the number of people uh, walking in this environment. We've done surveys which indicate that there's um, 6,000 pedestrians using customised key per day um, on very narrow footways at the moment. Therefore, the wider footways will certainly improve conditions um, for those users. Um, by contrast, there's, there's around 2,500 vehicles using customised keys, so there's far more pedestrians than, than vehicles in that area. So reallocating some of that space to assist with pedestrians will be of benefit. On his second point around um, does the data from these sensors uh, on the cycleway show any trends in the number of journeys by cycle? And does this indicate a growing demand for in improved cycle infrastructure? Um, I would say that that um, Weymouth has a, a, um, a reasonable cycle network to begin with. It has 24 kilometres of cycleways. We have seen a, a substantial increase in cycle use in recent years. Um, in some places, it's, it's over double how it was in over the last five years. Uh, in, in some places, uh, it's it's even more than that over a long period of time. Um, so the, the answer is it is growing and um, there probably is a demand for improved cycle infrastructure and we have certainly submitted uh, bids to national government for further funding to assist with that. Um, I think in this location, we, um, we obviously did uh, a major consultation in January and February, and we've subsequently done further consultations. And um, you know, we have to acknowledge that there's a lot of stakeholders who feel very strongly about this and um, uh, take the view that that this is not the location where they they want to see uh, contemporary cycling at, at the present moment. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Thank you, Christopher. Are there any questions of a technical nature for the presenters? I have Councillor Councillor Weller, Chairman, who, who and Councillor Paul Kimber, who may have technical questions. They don't indicate as such. And Kate Weller's is non-technical, so if you'd like to take Councillor Paul Kimber first. Yes, Councillor Kimber, you, have you got a technical question? Yes, uh, yes, yes, Chair. Um, yeah, this is a fantastic scheme. Uh, I want to ask a question regarding the paving and the, and the special measures that we are um, doing with the paving and my heart always goes out that we've done the uh, paving um, around in Dorset and suddenly the services come along dig up for water electricity or ourselves and it never quite goes back or it doesn't go back the same but suddenly we got uh, tarmac I wonder if you could have Give me some sort of answer how we can actually protect this vis visual look of how you know it's obviously going to look very very nice when complete. And what, how, how we how we can safeguard this? That's the technical question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kimber. And I'll hand that back to you, Christopher, for a response. Thank you, Chairman. I'm not probably best placed to respond to this, but I know that some of the decisions we have we've tried to um, to reach have involved our maintenance colleagues, and um, the I think there's kind of two points. One, there's not a huge amount of services on the custom house key itself. Obviously, it used to have a a rail line along there, so there's there's limited amount of of utilities in the road itself. Certainly, there's quite a few under the footway on the northern side, and uh, in some of the the, the junction mouths. Um, one of the reasons for using this material um, is that it should be easier to reinstate as uh, per that, rather than using more expensive materials, which then once a sort of slabbing has been removed, then sometimes you do end up putting back. Uh, bitmap rather than 
the uh, the high quality materials which are used to begin with. So we want to try and minimise those ongoing maintenance costs as much as possible by using a material which still looks nice but is is cheaper to install and and cheaper to maintain. Um, so, but um, yes, yeah, certainly the the need to ensure that um, the material goes back as it is when the uh, services went in is, um, is is something that we need to look at. OK, thank you very much, Nick Christopher. I understand that uh, uh, Andrew Bradley would also like to add the response. Over to you, Andrew. Yes, I can. I can add to uh, Chris's comments in the Institute Road example that uh, was shown as part of the presentation. We've designated um, Institute Road effectively a special area so that if utility companies go in, dig a trench um, and then resurface, they are obliged to resurface and make good with like for like. And that would be the expectation um, along Custom House Key. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Do we have any other questions of a technical nature, Bill? Uh, I have the portfolio holder, Councillor Ray Bryan, who, who would like to speak, but I'm not quite certain, Chairman, if that's a technical issue. Uh, it's not, all a, I can not a technical for. question, am I reading that, Ray? Um, I don't believe it to be technical. It was to uh, A, support Chris in what he's just said, in as much as highways now look at um, the replacement work done by utility people and we do take a lot of precautions to make sure that it doesn't um, happen just after we've laid a road. We have a similar instance to this at the moment up in the north of the county uh, where we've, we've actually stopped work to allow utilities to deal with their work under an emergency. So we we have difficulty with emergencies, but planned work uh, we get plenty of notice on. And I have instructed highways to make sure that when we get the replacement work done, it is inspected by our team to make sure that they've done it to our standards uh, for the future. If I can just come back in on one point, please, Chairman. Um, uh, I, I was losing connection, so I hopefully I've got this right. There was a concern expressed earlier on as to why um, the two cycle, the contraflow cycle lane had been taken out. This was taken out after me considering a lot of the objections that were put in and also talking to the local businesses. Um, their concern was that because this is a touristy area where people get quite relaxed, one could walk out of one of the restaurants thinking that they need to look left because that's the way the traffic is coming and they may find a cycle coming from the right where they 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 wouldn't have realized um, and this was the reason that I asked this to be withdrawn last time round, so I could give due consideration to it take into account the views of the local people and uh, as I say we've now amended this to exclude uh, the contraflow. We have got contraflows working very well elsewhere, but they don't have restaurants right at the side of them and they don't have people in a very relaxed mode, which is what we want for the people of Weymouth and the visitors. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Ray. Is there any other technical questions, Bill? Uh, no more technical questions, Chairman, so you're free to open okay. the debate. Right, before we open the debate, I would like to point out that Weymouth and Portland Berwick Council examined potential schemes for improving the town centre from 2015 to 2019, including proposals for the improvement of the harbourside area. This highlighted the necessity to reduce on-street parking to accommodate various enterprises that would appeal to the residents of Weymouth. The removal of the har harbour tramway was awarded funding from the Department of Transport in 2020 to allow full summer access for visitors and allow hospitality businesses based within the harbour area sufficient space for outside facilities. The Town Council has requested improvements to the harbour and have previously indicated they have no objections to the proposed order. Over the first half of the 2021 engagement activities have also taken place 
with the Harbour Consultative Group, with individual business owners in the harbour and with other stakeholders. It is considered that the benefits of the proposed enhanced scheme and dedicated loading bays for harbour businesses outweigh the inconvenience of the required loss of the small number of one hour parking on straight parking spaces. Um, right, OK, I'm now going to open the debate to members and who do we wish to speak first? Uh, Councillor Weller, Chairman, then Councillor Ireland. Councillor Weller and Councillor Ireland. So we're going to go in Councillor Weller. Oh, doesn't work. <coughs> Ireland. OK, right, Councillor Weller, we'll have to go ahead. Let's thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, can I start by saying actually I was involved in that sort of 2014, 2015 um, work and before that as well. So this is a, a long time in the making and a long time in the discussing and uh, a lot of iterations along the way. Um, I'd like to thank um, our officers. Um, for the way that they engaged with um, all of the councillors south of the Ridgeway and in particular the um, adjacent ward members. Uh, they, they were incredibly good um, at keeping us uh, in the loop at all times and I think that that's a, a good a good way forward because it has meant that they've they've had a lot of um, of uh, engagement with that and with residents um, and the upshot of that has been among other things the removal of the suggestion of a contraflow cycle path for all the reasons that um, Chris mentions and Councillor Brian as well and it's very welcome to me and to everyone I think because it was seen as um, a hazard with so many pedestrians in that location so thank you very much for that thank you also for the, your engagement with um, our Weymouth and Portland access group um, you really took on board all of their points and I think that um, with I, I can't think of any exceptions where we haven't um, uh, taken their advice on the, uh, uh, the, the the access for people in wheelchairs, people with um, uh, mobility and sight impairments and so on. So that's very, very welcome. Um, Andrew Bradley's uh, information on repairing of, of the surfaces uh, by utilities is very reassuring as well because we all know how ugly it looks when pavias come up and they're not put down in, in, in the correct way and, and the hazards that that creates. So I'm very pleased with that. Um, on, on the whole, uh, and I have to say that as a local person, I, I wept when the tracks were taken up. That's part of my, my childhood and it was, it was a very sad day, but life goes on and we have to move with it. Um, so I understand that as well. Um, I, I just would like to say that at all times, and I know Councillor Bryan understands this, we are a working harbour in Weymouth and whilst our tourists are very important to us, they must not impede the work of our fishermen and our charter boats who are world renowned. Um, so just keep bear that in mind at all times. And I know that you are um, and in every other respect, this has been a long time coming and it is very, very welcome. Thank you very much, Chairman, for giving me that opportunity. Thank you, Councillor Weller. Now I go to uh, Councillor Nick Arth. Over to you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, <laughs> Councillor uh, Weller's comment there about weeping when um, the, the lines were taking out. Well, I, I didn't quite weep, but I certainly swore when um, I came off and ended up in a &E. So I'm quite happy to see them gone. And you know, it's looking a lot nicer, to be honest, and it's a lot more usable for our tourist industry. And I think it's still usable for our fishermen as well. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I have to put my hand up. I, I have been in the past one of those people who drive around looking for the one hour free parking spaces. I think you know if you go to Dorchester, you don't do that because they essentially don't exist. And sooner the people will get used to the fact that they don't exist. They won't drive around and around and around in circles, which is what everybody used to do. Um, so I'm quite happy to propose this. Um, let's cut to the quick. Thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Councillor Allen. Do we have any other speakers, Bill? Uh, yes, Chairman, we've got Councillor Paul Kimber. Paul Kimber, thank you. Over to you, Paul. 
Thank you, Chair, and I'll be delighted to uh, second this. Um, Kate said a lot, a lot about the disabled access and uh, the access group, how, how they supported this, and I'm, I'm absolutely delighted what um, the technical side of the access group were, were able to promote. Uh, I'm also pleased about with promoting walking and cycling. I, I know it'd be one way, and I think that 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 is sounds sounds to be good. The one thing I noticed, uh, which makes me really happy to support this, was when we had the temporary uh, area. I noticed how it, the the mood of the people changed dramatically. How. Yeah, you know, there was a really, really happy atmosphere that you see some uh, only on some some of the times when Weymouth uh, promotes special days around the harbour. Our harbour is special, and yes, it is a working harbour as as well as. And I think we we've done a great d deed today by promoting this not only for tourism but but for the social side. And I I hope this idea, dear. Uh, idea around that harbour goes further around it. I think we can do so much more around that harbour. Thank you, Chair, and happy to second. Thank you very much indeed. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Who do we have uh, next to speak, uh, Bill? Uh, that, that's the, the final one, uh, Chairman. Councillor, uh, Councillor Kimber was the last one. Right, OK, in that case then, um, uh, uh, if there's no more deliberation, members are content that they have heard the entire presentation and debate. I will uh, take a vote to make a mind to resolution by roll call and I'll go through an order and I'll start off with Councillor Dave Bowell. Yeah, minded to approve, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Kelvin Clayton. Yes, yeah, support, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Susan Cocking. Minded to approve, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Jean Dancer. Approved, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Bill Pike. Four, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, for clarity, Councillor Nick Ireland. Four. For clarity, Councillor Paul Kimber. Four, Chair. Councillor Kate Weller. Four. Thank you. Councillor John Worth. Minded to approve, Chairman. I'm in favour as well. That is unanimous. Right, that concludes uh, the items, the main items on the agenda. Item six on the agenda. Do you need to uh, take the oh, line? Oh, oh. Look, I'm going to get sacked because I keep on forgetting Mike. Uh, I now ask Mike Garrity to make the full uh, so decision on this item. Sorry to interrupt, Chairman. In, in, this, in this case, it will not be um, a decision made by the head of planning. It is uh, Councillor Bryan as portfolio holder who has the delegated power to make this decision. In that case, then, I, I, I now ask uh, Ray Bryan to make the formal decision on this item. Over to you, Ray. I'm now very quickly trying to turn my mic on. Having heard all the debate and the comments passed today, I am very happy to forward my delegated decision on this issue uh, to those that need to have it so we can get on with this work as quickly as possible. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Bryan. OK, item six on the agenda. Urgent items. I have uh, no prior notification of any items of business which is considered to be urgent pursuant to section 100B, 4B of the Local Government Act 1972. Item seven on the agenda is exempt business and I have no prior notification of any uh, item viewed as likely to disclose exempt information within the meaning of the paragraph three of schedule 12A to the local Government Act 1972 as amended. Committee, I would like to thank you very much indeed for your indulgence and those members of the public who are, are booked in, staying with us until now. That concludes this particular meeting. And I then therefore close the meeting at 12.32. Thank you, Chairman. I must away now. As